Hey, church, welcome back to a weekly service here at Church Home in the month of February, Black History Month here in the United States of America, wherever you are watching in the world. We're so glad you joined us. This is part two in a very, I should say, quick study, but a study nonetheless of Romans chapter five. Last week, we studied two verses. This week, we'll study three verses. And um, if you are feeling pressure. Right now, as we speak, this sermon is dedicated to you. Now, pressure is a synonym, at least today it is, with pain. So I guess when I say pressure, I also mean pain. If you are going through pain that feels a lot like pressure or going through pressure that is producing pain in your life, this sermon is for you, and it is so specifically spoken about. In fact, in a moment, we are gonna discover uh, kind of a journey that the human soul goes on. It is a, a succession of postures and emotions that Paul outlines. Again, he is writing the Book of Romans that we now call it, is a letter written to Jesus followers living in ancient Rome, 10 square miles, populated by nearly, if not more than a million people. It is a very concentrated cultural epicenter of the world, and it is these words written to ancient Jesus followers that I think speak so much to us as modern Jesus followers. Now, if you're not a Jesus follower, this is also a really good moment for you to kind of investigate the nuances and the idiosyncrasies and the details of what it looks like if in fact you became a Jesus follower. Now today is unusual because if you're considering becoming someone who follows the ways and person of Jesus, you'll discover very quickly, this is how Jesus followers deal with pain and pressure. So I'm titling this message today, this part two of Romans chapter five, finding purpose in pressure or finding purpose in pain. I want to start by uh, kind of putting into my own words a very famous quote and statement made by C.S. Lewis, the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, amongst many other books. Uh, I actually think he wrote a book called The Problem of Pain or The Problem with Pain. But he said this about God and how he connects with us. He said, in our pleasures, God whispers. In our conscience, he speaks. But in our pain, he shouts. He claims that pain is a megaphone used by God to rouse a deaf world. Wow. So let's kind of absorb that for a moment, that maybe, perhaps, in our pleasure, God whispers. In our day-to-day -day life and in our conscience, he speaks. But in our pain, in our pressure, maybe he shouts. Maybe right now, if you're in the middle of pain and pressure, you... Maybe, perchance, perhaps, could hear the clearest you have ever heard from the divine. What a concept. Now, I want to read Romans chapter 5, and I'm going to start again with verse 1, what we started last week, and I'll read all the way to what is now we call verse 6. It says, Our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us and now declares us flawless in his eyes. This means we can now enjoy true and lasting peace with God, all because of what the Lord Jesus has done, the anointed one. Our faith guarantees us permanent access into this marvelous kindness that has given us a perfect, last week we talked about a perfect relationship with God. What incredible joy bursts forth within us as we keep on celebrating our hope of experiencing God's glory. Now, the three verses we will study today. And that's not all, Paul says. Even in times of trouble, pain, pressure, we have a joyful confidence knowing that our pressures would develop in us patient endurance. Our patient endurance will refine our character and our proven character leads us back to hope or his promises. And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy because we can now experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Last week, we ended with, hey, let's keep on celebrating our hope of experiencing God and his essence and his character. And then Paul picks up in what we call verse three and says, hey, but that's not all. You can keep on celebrating 
God's perfect performance through Jesus. You can keep on celebrating the fact that you have peace with God, you have connection with God, you have access with God, even in painful chapters, in seasons full of pressure. Are you in a painful chapter? Are you in a chapter or era or moment or season of your life where there is immense pressure? Perhaps you will hear God shouting. But Paul wants us to know, as he wanted ancient Jesus followers living in a highly concentrated uh, cultural epicenter, he wanted them to know, hey, listen, even when times are tough, now if you know ancient Rome, there was diseases, there was outrageous sexual promiscuity. I haven't said promiscuity in a long time, but there was all kinds of orgies and parties and things, and there was uh, diseases floating around and very incredible challenges through this densely populated ancient city with none of the modern means that you and I have today. So he say, listen, if if there are diseases that spring out amongst you, if there's pain and pressure and problems, hey, you, you can continue on rejoicing. And it's like, I can? What do you mean? Now, I mean, I, I kind of shudder to start to think about like all the different ways Jesus followers have handled pain, sickness, disease, persecution, criticism, critique, loss, brokenness. There have been some belief systems, or I should say some parts of this belief system that have kind of almost sought after pain and pressure as if it is a medal of honor, as if if you're really noble and you're really godly and you really know Jesus, your sickness, your disease, your pain, your plight, your diagnosis of cancer, all of these things are a medal of honor. Well, I don't see Jesus in his earthly ministry inflicting anyone with disease. In fact, just the opposite. Jesus is constantly healing people of ailments and pains and problems and sicknesses and disease. Furthermore, he's aligning himself with the marginalized that were overlooked by the religious institution of his day. So, I don't think it's fair to say or even accurate to say that we should wear pressure and pain and problems and calamity as some sort of a badge of merit or honor declaring to us that we are more highly elevated in our spiritual journey. I just think that things happen. There's another way to say that, but we won't say that in church. Stuff happens, doesn't it? To the good people and the bad people as if there are any, but I think we're all flawed and broken. But you know what I mean, you know, give and it shall be given. And that whole reciprocity and the concept that if I open a door for a senior citizen, that maybe doors will open for me. And we think through these processes, but some of those are so natural. And the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. Translation, bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. Welcome to planet Earth. So setting aside for a moment that Pain and problems and pain and problems and pressure are somehow a popular concept of nobility and morality. Let's let's set that over here and let's just accept together for a moment that pain and pressures will come for whatever reason. Now what will we do? Paul says you can have joyful confidence. You can have joyful confidence. You can have joyful confidence. Have you lost a loved one? Have you got a diagnosis of disease in your body? Do you feel lonely? Do you feel isolated? Do you feel marginalized? Do you feel overlooked? Has war threatened the country you live in? Or has war come upon the part of the planet you're on? Have you lost more friends and loved ones than you can count? Has pressure and pain touched you in a way that you will never forget? You can only imagine those who are watching this moment. I can only imagine in this February 2024 what you're actually facing. In fact, the word pressure might not even begin to describe what you're facing right now. In fact, you might be insulted with how light and little the word pressure, the English word pressure, even begins to describe the depths of the ache and the loss and the disenfranchisement you feel as I speak right now. And yet, Paul says, 
you can have joyful confidence. Joyful confidence? How can I have joyful confidence? How can I have joyful confidence when my best friend passed? How can I have joyful confidence when shootings persist in this country? How can I have joyful confidence when injustice seems to be programmed and baked into a system that misrepresents your people group or you as an individual? How, how, how can I have joyful confidence? Let's talk about this progression. Because Paul goes on to say we can have a joyful confidence knowing what? Knowing that our pressures will develop patience and endurance. Patient endurance will refine our character and proving character leads us back to hope. And this hope doesn't disappoint. Let's find some purpose in our pressure, in our pain today. Here's the progression as I have written out. Pressure teaches persistence. Persistence leads us to purging. And the purging reveals his promise. Let's go over that again, because this is the progression. I'm going to do my best to describe in the original language. His, this is what happens. Pressure teaches persistence. Persistence leads us to a, a purging, a purifying of sorts. And that purifying suddenly reveals to us the extraordinary, extensive, and eternal promises of God. Let's start with the idea of trouble, pain. As we call it today, pressure. The Greek word for pressure, and again, I probably am not going to pronounce this correctly as I'm still struggling with my own English, but the lipsis. The ellipsis is used 45 times in the New Testament. It is this concept of pressure. It actually means to crush. In ancient times, people who were, how should I say, not model citizens of respective countries, they would crush them to death. It speaks of crushing, it speaks of pressure. I don't mean to be odd, but I think sometimes we actually can feel this literal pressure in our chest. I believe in breathing techniques and breathing activities. I believe that your breath, you know, breathe in in four seconds, breathe out four seconds, that it can actually alleviate sometimes the pressure that we carry in, in our actual shoulders and neck and body. I've seen chiropractors and therapists and people who do body work and they'll tell you like, whoa, you carry a lot of stress in your neck or your shoulders. And we actually, our bodies can manifest the pressures and stresses of our life. And I'm so grateful for scripture because it acknowledges that. Say, listen, there's, there's pressure in your life. There is a pressing on both sides of you. Maybe you feel family pressure, emotional pressure, moral pressure, spiritual pressure. Maybe you're watching this and you're like, man, I feel so much pressure to believe what you're saying, but I don't believe it. I feel so much pressure to be in the church. I feel so much pressure to be better and try harder. What do I do with this pressure? Well, you got to go back to verses one and two. These are all connected. These verses uh, in their original form were not written as standalone verses. They were a continual thought. Now, keep in mind, in context, when we get to verses 3, 4, and 5 of Romans chapter 5, we've already established that you have a perfect relationship with God. So the idea is this. When you feel the pressure and you feel the crushing, you got to go back to the reality that I have a perfect relationship with God. I have access to God. I have peace with God. And so in the midst of this crushing or this pressuring or this paining, it says, I can have joyful confidence knowing that the pressure will develop in me a patient endurance, or in other words, a persistence. Again, what are we doing right now? We are trying to find some purpose in the pressure and pain of life, which touches and affects us all, whether you are a preacher, doctor, lawyer, uh, uh, an employer, uh, a dentist, uh, uh, a stay-at-home mom or dad, a single mom, a single dad, wherever you are, we're all going to experience pressure. 
even if you're the most generous person in the world or the most stingy person in the world, how are you going to find purpose in pressure? It's established in this idea that, hey, I got a perfect relationship with God. I still have haven and harbor with him. I can go to him. I have peace with him. We are unbroken in our connection and our relationship. And by the way, I am feeling this pressure, man. It does not promise that those who have a relationship with Jesus won't feel pressure. In fact, Paul seems to allude to the idea, which is wild to consider, that if you follow Jesus, you might feel more pressure than others, more pain than others. This, we don't have time to outline all of the individuals in this narrative, in this story, who because they believed in the way of Jesus, their lives were taken from them in horrific, agonizing and painful ways. So I, I can't look at the camera right now in this February of 2024 and tell you that if you follow the way of Jesus, you will be free from pressure and pain. But I will tell you that your pressure and your pain can lead you into further persistence. The word for endurance in the Greek here is hupomone. It's one of my favorite. It means a spirit and a soul that overcomes adversity, that you can grow. Your persistence is a muscle that can grow. It says, hey, listen, joyfully, confidently know this, that your pressure will produce in you a persistence. The progression continues. Suddenly, this persistence leads you to one of my least favorite Greek words that we will study today, and that is a, a purging. This Greek word is dokami, dokame. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it right. I'm sure of it. So if you're a scholar out there with perfect Greek, please email me and help me. But here's what it means. It means like when silver is tested by fire and purified. The dross comes to the surface and the silversmith wipes off the dross. That is the sledge mixed in with the silver. And the silversmith will slack or slide the sledge off the silver until he can see his reflection. I know it hurts. I know it's painful. I have my own pressure. I have my own pain. Not for a moment would I do the fruitless comparative work of saying whose pain is worse. But my brothers and sisters, are we not all experiencing our own respective levels of pressure? In the sports world, the uh, popularized concept has uh, been brought up over and over and over in our modern era, and that is that pressure is a privilege. I think Billie Jean King was the first to say it, the great tennis legend, but pressure is a privilege, is it? It doesn't feel like a privilege. It feels like pain, doesn't it? But you know that pain can lead to persistence. That persistence can have a purging effect in your life. And guess what is revealed? Hope or promise. You know what you need right now, whether you feel like it or not? In the middle of your pressure, you know what you need? Hope. But here's what I've noticed in the human experience. When we feel pain and pressure, hope is as elusive as the sun at midnight. It's just like, I can't find it. Hope for what? What is hope? It's the expectation of good. In fact, the Greek word for hope in, in, in the scripture is ellipse. Ellipse literally means this idea of hope, this word that's put here in Romans 5 for our adoration and admonition. It literally means to have the expectation of something grand and good that's about to happen to you. When you're in the midst of pain and pressure, the thing that is going to sustain you is not only his love and his grace and a perfect relationship, but this idea that this great gregarious God is going to work this together for my good and that in the near future, something grand and good might break out in the middle of my pain and pressure. Nothing in this life is going to bring my father back who died after years of battling cancer. A cancer that ironically today in 2024 is absolutely treatable and curable? You mean to tell me that some 12 years later after my dad was almost uh, deteriorated is the nicest word I can say by cancer? I hate cancer. 
Now the doctors and the physicians tell me we could have we could have treated it. But he's not coming back. That pain doesn't go away. But perhaps even in loss, what can return to me again is an expectation of something good that God still has prepared for me. I call them promises. You know what stinks? I was going to say sucks, but that's probably too intense for sermonizing. You know what really stinks about pain? Is it works like an eclipse. And if I have noticed and learned anything in some nearly three decades of leadership and pastoral work that has been my honor is that when pain settles in over someone's life, pressure settles in over someone's life, promises often get eclipsed. They can't even see them anymore. Here comes the pain and you can't even see the promise. The pain sets in and the person can't even see that today on this day, on this Sunday, you have a gift. See, there are no ordinary Sundays. There are no throwaway Sundays. There are no wasteful Mondays. There are no pointless Tuesdays. There are no stupid Wednesdays. There are no dumb Thursdays. And there are no fraudulent Fridays. Like I keep going. There are no silly Saturdays. Every day matters. But when the pain settles in, Monday becomes something to endure. Tuesday becomes something to get through. Wednesday becomes another diabolical reminder that you have lost, that you're under pressure. The journey that I have been on as a now 45-year-old man is hard to even describe, and I cannot do it in the time we're allotted. But I've had the privilege and the honor of sitting with some of the great athletes of my generation. In some cases, I get to call some of them friends. I don't mean that to sound funny or weird or boastful, but allow me the indulgence for a moment to tell you something. I have seen some of the great athletes of my generation in deep pain, feeling misrepresented, misunderstood, feeling like this country and countries of the world didn't understand what they were going through, mental health, physical ailments and pains, athletic uh, injuries that no one knew about. And yet the fodder would grow in the media of how bad they were now and they weren't performing and they weren't good and what's wrong with them. Isn't it amazing? So much of our lives are centered around accomplishment, elevation, increase of renown, finance, power, influence. And yet wherever you find yourself in life, at the top of your game or in the bottom of the barrel of your business, we all have pain. So what are we going to do? Are we going to spend the rest of our coffees and nights catching drinks together, making life about our pain, making life about our pressure? I had a friend text me this morning before we turned on the camera, and he said, I don't know how you do it. And I'm going to give you my honest response. I didn't stop to consider how I do. Because when I do, the pressure can sink in over me like a like that weighted blanket the dentist put on you when they're x-raying your teeth, if you've ever been there. That weighted vest that's supposed to keep you from all radiation in your body, that thing comes on you and that's how the pressure can hit me. And all of a sudden I realize, oh, a lot of people are depending on my journey with Jesus and my ability to articulate the story and oh my word and my friends meaning to encourage me. I don't know how you do it all. And you're like, I, I, I actually don't know how I do it all either. Are we going to make this about all we do and have done and deserved and earned and warranted and the pressure settles in over us like a solar eclipse and all of a sudden we are lost in the darkness and menagerie of our misrepresentation and pain? Or are we going to find purpose in the pain and the pressure? Are we going to allow the pressure to teach us persistence? Are we going to watch why while persistence leads us to purging. And then my favorite part of the whole progression is the purging all of a sudden reveals the promises. 
Now, I'm going to say this about pain and pressure, and I'm almost done. Oftentimes, pain and pressure leave you helpless and hopeless. But there is a progression that only the wonderful ways of God can introduce you to, where your pain and your pressure become the great revealer of your soul. And though you have heard his whisper, and though you have heard his speaking, it's as if suddenly you hear him shouting, I'm with you. What's that? It's called a promise, friend. That's what you're hearing. And I don't know why it's like this. And I wish C.S. Lewis was wrong, but something tells me he's not. Because I've known pleasure. And I didn't hear God shouting. And I've had some typical days. And I've heard him speaking. But I got to tell you, in the dark night of the soul, I have heard a volume from God unlike any other chapter of my life. And what ends up beginning to take center stage and focus in my life is that this is not the end. This is the beginning of eternity, of eternal life. That I will go home and this isn't home. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. And the Bible speaks of this in the book of Revelation. That these light momentary afflictions will give way to a far exceeding weight of glory. And my story is not complete here on earth. It will continue on into eternity. And though we may feel like there is nothing but loss and pain and agony, no matter what, we win. Can you and I together today find purpose in the pressure? I think we can. I think others before us have. Maybe that's where C.S. Lewis got that concept. Maybe that's how Martin Luther wrote his thesis. Maybe that's how Dr. King in the United States of America had so much righteous resolve in the fight for justice and equity in the streets of America. Maybe, perhaps, Mother Teresa, in the middle of her pain, and loss in Calcutta, saving and rescuing children in the garbage heaps of India, maybe it's because there was a purging in her pain and she saw the promises of God clearer than others did. I wonder if this pressure is a privilege. It kind of feels like it might be, right? That maybe... Maybe, just maybe, you might see God like you've never seen him before. You might see his plan and his promise for your life like you've never seen it before. And I pray that you'll catch a glimpse, even a glimmer, of what eternity might be like for you. So that mean, in the meantime, meanwhile, back here on earth, you might live to see another day. Get out of bed and have a sense of hope that perhaps on this Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, God has something great and good for you to receive and do. Simply put, this is the only way I have found purpose in my pain, purpose in my pressure. This is it. And lastly, I end by reading the conclusion of the scripture. And it says this. This hope does not, is not a disappointing fantasy, verse 5 says. Because we can now experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. I think one of the ways you know God is already turning your pain and pressure into purpose and promise is that even right now you feel his overwhelming sense of love cascading into your soul because his spirit lives inside of you. And so some onlookers might ask, how, oh, how have you lived another day? And I pray it will catch us by surprise because we'll be so preoccupied with God, his love, and his promises that fill every single new day. Let me pray. God, I thank you 
I thank you for your promises. The hope that we have that there are no throwaway days. That every day is appointed and dictated and determined by you. Help us now to somehow get a glimpse of forever, eternity, while we are encased in linear time and space. Help us. We love you, oh wonderful God. And the same that you did for ancient Romans, living in a densely populated city, so you will help us today in our modern world, so many of us living in densely populated cities. Help us to find purpose in our pressure and our pain. If you're watching this broadcast right now, and in this February of 2024, you are in fact ready to receive the free gift of Jesus, I'm going to ask you to do that. You know what I'm about to say somehow, don't you? There's a God. He loves you. And he's already made a way for you to be forgiven forever. So if you receive it, then say it. I receive him. And so that's it. You're forgiven forever. You're his forever. You've taken your seat at the proverbial table of God's eternal family. And you will be there forever. I love you, friend. I pray you feel encouraged today. And remember, you are not alone in your pain. You are not alone in your pressure. We're in this together. Let us know if we can help you on Pastor Chat. And I'll see you next week as we continue our study of Romans chapter 5.
Let it be on earth as it is in heaven. Let it be on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, what you want to do, what you want to see, how you want to move. God, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. What you wanna do?